My name's Bill Bill Joyce. Physically, I'm 65, uh, about six foot. I'm fairly outgoing, but also a, a somewhat quiet and, and keep to myself a lot. I enjoy helping people. I, I like working with younger people, uh, helping them to navigate this place a little bit easier and maybe make this their last time coming here. Um, I'm active in the chapel. I'm active at work. I'm active with the Concerned Lifers organization. Um, I'm a facilitator with alternatives to violence. Um, so I try and keep as busy as I can. So how many years have you been in prison? Um, altogether about 14. Do you have a release date? I do. It's in 2035. How old were you when you were released? 81. You know, I committed the crime uh, that I did. I, I pled guilty to it. I took the responsibility for it. The act was the act. And um, I had regrets from that very first day. And so that made it easier, much easier for me to accept the fact that there was a long sentence. Um, in fact, one of the one of the family members of, of uh, the victim of my crime said something at, during my sentencing that I'll never forget. And, and it was that it was her hope that I would help others while I was here. So as they, when they got out, they wouldn't commit new crimes. And so I've, I've taken that to heart um, throughout the entire time I've been, been locked up. And, uh, it's been a powerful message for me. So. The, the Department of Corrections isn't set up for that. I, I don't think that they were ever designed to handle older prisoners. Certainly the prisons aren't designed for it. Um, I'm, not, I'm not knocking Department of Corrections at all. I think they're doing the best they can with the way the laws are set up and the way that the system is set up. Um, they're not supposed to be an elder care organization. That's not their role, but they've been forced into it. Because of that, there's a lot of difficult access. Prisons are either, like this one is vertical, where there's a lot of stairs. And those that don't have stairs are horizontal laid out, and there's long walking distances from one place to another. Um, there are some prisons that people have come here. I haven't been there personally, but they've come here. This is from their living room, at, their living unit, to where they eat is as much as half a mile in some of these prisons. Um, so the facilities aren't set up. They're not set up to take care of the medical issues that develop with aging. Um, clinics aren't equipped for it. Um, the staff is not trained for it. Uh, and so it's, it's just DOC has been forced into a role without being equipped to do it. It was hurting either an ache or an ailment and it's difficult to get it treated. Um, costs are skyrocketing, I'm told, and I believe it wholeheartedly. Um, and so if it's not essentially a life-threatening matter, oftentimes it gets delayed or not done at all. And people live with chronic pain all the time here. Um, that causes anger, causes frustration. Um, it, it causes, there's, there's congestion when you have somebody who's 20-something trying to rush to get to, to a place and there's somebody who's 60 something or 70 something in front of them. Um, it's, it's does, I'm not suggesting any, anything gets, gets violent, but there's, there's a rush. And it's like traffic when you've got somebody driving faster than someone else, you've got to go around and, and it causes all kinds of everyday little problems in a place that's only a few acres large. It's a lot more difficult in aging in society. I don't have access to a physician of my choice. I don't have, I can't shop around for what health care program I, is, best suits me. Um, 
I'm given what they give me. And that's essentially the limit of it. Uh, I don't get to choose my medications. I, don't, I get to choose whether I take them or not, but I don't get, don't get to choose what they are. Um, the cells are, here are very small. Uh, most people don't have to share them, which is a, which is a good thing. Um, but they're very small. I can stretch my arms from, and touch the side walls uh, of the cell, and that has a, a bunk, a desk, a, a sink, a toilet, and all of that to, to share that space with. Um, everything is metal and concrete, very much cold sinks, so things are very cold in the winter and very hot in the summer. Um, when that, that doesn't affect a younger person near as much as it does when you grow older, those temperature changes. Um, mattresses are incredibly thin. Mine's right now probably about, is worn down to about three quarters of an inch thick. Um, others, it, they start out at two inches perhaps, but, um, and I wake up sore in the morning. Um, just from essentially laying on steel. Um, but probably the, the most difficult is not the physical. It's, I'm not with my wife. And that's harder on her than it is on me. DOC takes care of my needs. I have food to eat. I have a place to sleep. It may not be the most comfortable, but it's there. And, and she has to fend for herself. So it's difficult knowing that and not being able to do anything about it. The families of the people who commit the crime are the invisible victims of the crime. Um, they're not considered victims, but they are. Um, my crime destroyed two families. Uh, the, the man whom I killed and then his family, but also my family. Being separated um, makes it hard on the family who, as I said, they have to, to live without a husband or a, or a wife or a mother or father. The last study I saw said that children who's, who has a parent incarcerated are seven times more likely to end up in the criminal justice system. That's a terrible statistic. Um, if both parents are locked up, it's almost a certainty that that child will end up in prison himself or herself. Um, there's a loss to society in human resource. One of the things that was most shocking to me is how really smart, in a very productive way, people in prison are. People who never made it basically even into high school and dropped out and lived on the streets come here and earn degrees under very difficult conditions because you can't sit in school full time. You have to do other activities. Um, or the classes may not be available, but we have people earning degrees and we have people teaching subjects that they struggled with in school. Um, this is a resource society can use. Um, our schools are struggling. Um, and we have people here who can do things and, and they're not able to. And so both society and families can benefit and nobody really benefits from keeping somebody who's not a threat here. It, it, it doesn't do anyone any good. A lot of thought went into it. And I guess 
the main focus in, in, in trying to draft this was public safety. Um, that was the overreaching concern because we all have families outside. And if something that we do in here that, that somehow uh, contributes to a law being changed that makes them more unsafe, that's not a good thing. And so public safety was our main concern. How can we better use limited resources and make the public safer at the same time? And one of the things we saw was that in a lot of study and a lot of reports and academic papers, we've, we've poured through them. And one thing that, that stands out very clear is that recidivism, return to crime, tr starts dropping dramatically in the late 40s and early 50s, especially if somebody has done 10 or more years incarcerated. And it seems that for many of these studies that either the, it's the people who have committed a violent crime are those least likely to commit new crimes, which is counter to common sense. You know, we would normally think that it would be the opposite, but it, it turns out that these studies are confirming that it's the people who have done a single violent crime, then spent 10 or more years in prison, their recidivism rate is among the lowest. Um, but they're the ones doing the longest sentence. We've, so we, we looked at that and we said, prisoners who are 50 or older also costs per year start skyrocketing. And when they get into their 60s, it, it really starts being a, a horrendous burden on the system. At the same time, they're the least likely to reoffend. So we're paying a lot to get very little back. Now, if there was unlimited money, even a one or two or five percent chance that somebody's going to reoffend, you could say, well, it's worth it. But we don't have unlimited money. And every day we release hundreds of people back to the streets that aren't ready to get out, that are going to commit more crimes, they're going to commit things, and, and they're going to be future victims because the system doesn't have enough money to both house people who are aging and spend the money necessary to give the younger ones, the short time people, what they need not to commit a new crime. There just isn't the resources to do both. And so far we've chosen to keep the elderly locked up at the expense of rehabilitation and we create more victims. I've looked at, at legislation before. I've, I've got a legal background. And so um, we have tried to have legislation before the legislature for a number of years. And people on the outside, good, good people, have, have drafted proposed bills and sent them to the legislature. Legislators have drafted bills. We decided this time to try one on our own and say, OK, let's write something that from our perspective it would accomplish a number of things. Uh, we have a, a set of core values that we look at. And, and one of them is that is that prison should be to house people who are a danger to society. And when a person is no longer a danger to society, then alternatives need to be examined other than prison. Because of all the options that we have, prison is the most expensive. Um, it's very effective for people who are a danger to society. As that danger decreases, the effectiveness of prison decreases but the cost goes up. Um, so we wanted to look at that. We also looked, wanted to look at what was humane. Is it 
really a part of our American moral system to, to keep somebody in prison who is not a threat? Is it part of our, of our culture to say that we don't care what you have done to change inside? We're not going to change what we do to you. Is that, is, I thought we were a redemptive society. Um, so we looked at these things. And so I was asked to, to, uh, to try and put something together that, that could blend our, our values and our, 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 our beliefs in a, in a, thing, in a way that, that would enhance public safety. Um, and so we looked at a lot of st studies, in, both in Washington and uh, you know, from the University of Washington has done a number of these, um, and also across the nation. And what we found was that the, a couple of, of graphs came together at, at certain focal points. Um, one of them is aging, and, and people age out of prison. Um, most crimes are committed by people in, who are under 30. Um, some of the times this behavior will continue into the 30s, but by the time a person is 40, they're pretty much done being a knucklehead. Um, there's always exceptions, but as a general rule, and by the time somebody's 50, crime's pretty much out of their system. Again, exceptions always exist. Um, the other one is length of incarceration. And we, we notice an interesting trend that length of incarceration had a, a dramatic uh, correspondence with recidivism. And there was a pretty steep curve, de declining or decreasing recidivism with, with length of incarceration until you reached about 12 years. Um, I wish I could remember the name of the, of the two principal studies, but both of them had a little footnote um, that said that for rounding for political reasons, they're recommending a 15 year mark. That gives a little bit of, of, of extra safety, a safety margin in there. Um, and so we're looking at age, length of time, and it seemed to, to be at a, at a pretty significant crossroads at 12 to 15 year incarceration point and that 45 to 50 to 55 year range of age. Um, and recidivism dropped to virtually the same as the general population because we because if you figure that almost two percent of the American population is either incarcerated or under supervision of some kind um, and so when you get down to that range you're, you're basically the same as the general population um, so we put together legislation that would address this what I consider a pretty significant, uh, you know, correspondence of, of data. Um, so we proposed that a, a review process for prisoners who had reached the age of 50 or older, who had been in for a minimum of 15 years on their present incarceration. So we're not aggregating you did three years here and five years here. It's at a single time on the present incarceration. And what a person would be eligible for at that point was a review. So one thing that we were adamant about is that there's not an automatic release. It's not cutting down sentences to 15 years. What it means is that a board of qualified people will look at you and say, do you still need to be in prison? And if so, what do you need to do in order to no longer be a threat to society? And if you're not a threat to society, how do we step you out and get you reintegrated back into society? So it's, it's both not an automatic release, nor is it just open the doors and, and give you a bus ticket to go. There's a systematic mechanism in, in place that, um, that the Department of Corrections would, would supervise and also assist 
in that reintegration process. Yeah. Yeah, we were very concerned that it would not be an automatic release. Um, because, you know, it's going to take time for, for guys to, to reacclimate. Um, you know, it's very different in here than it is outside. You know, I make as, I, I used to make as many decisions in a day that I probably make in several weeks inside because most of the decisions were made for me. Um, and that's something that people have to get used to again. I'm adamant that everyone is capable of change. Not everyone changes. But I think everybody should have the opportunity to demonstrate that they have changed sufficiently as to no longer be a threat. Some people and some crimes, that's going to be fairly easy. Others, it's going to be extremely difficult. When the matter of do we include aggravated first degree murder in this, which is generally the sticking point. When you look at what the aggravating factors are, almost any, God, I hate the phrase regular first degree murder because they're all terrible. But any non-aggravated first degree murder could be made aggravated. The factors that make it aggravated are so broad and so encompassing that, that it would be the very rare first degree murder that, that couldn't be aggravated. We know of people who have second degree murder convictions that because of perhaps a weakness in the case initially, a reluctant witness, any number of reasons, they pled to a second degree murder that could very easily have been a very serious aggravated first degree murder. Every year murderers are released from prisons. It happens. Um, so a charging decision that was made, usually because the person went to trial, shouldn't be the determining factor on whether that person's safe to release or not. That should be a factor. Certainly, um, you, you can't dismiss the crime itself as a, as a factor for what, what needs to be demonstrated. Um, somebody who has a, a drug addiction and has robbed several stores has to demonstrate certain things to, to, to be considered safe for release. A person who doesn't have that history but who committed a very serious violent crime has to show something different, but they both have to show something. So the crime is very relevant, but it shouldn't be the only factor. What's happened since that crime should be what's weighed against the crime to see if that person is, is, is safe. As I said, prison is the most expensive alternative, and that money spent on people who don't need to be in prison because they're not a danger anymore is money that is not spent on somebody who does need to be here and who does need to rehabilitation. Thank you, Bill. You're welcome. Is there anything else that you'd like to say? I just want to really emphasize that I honestly believe that, that this bill increases public safety. That was my main concern. There's a lot of prisoners that aren't going to like the bill if it's expanded to, to have a review for everybody. That's not what we're proposing right now because I don't think the legislature is ready for it. But there'll be a lot of people who won't like that because they'll end up spending more time because they're going to have to demonstrate they're safe to be released. Ultimately, I think that's where the legislature and the state will go to. This bill doesn't touch on that, but it does require a demonstration of safety. And then we'll free up the funds and the resources to make the rest of the people who are getting out 
safer to release. And we hope that by doing this, we'll cut down on the number of victims in the future.